Um, some of you have this open on your own. So I just, um, I don't know if you guys ever noticed these, like sometimes I want to expound on stuff. And so there's information down below on some of these slides. Um, so I think it's always good to read those because when I'm going through full screen, you don't necessarily see that. Okay, um, so here we go. So last uh, we were together, we were talking about population ecology um, and we talked about like why an ecologist would want to study populations individually and one, um, like we talked about how some of those populations have a purpose to us, whether it's medicinally or agriculturally, um, or they serve a very important role within the ecosystem. And so we need to conserve that population in order to maintain the diversity within the ecosystem. Um, we talked about invasive species and how they can affect um, the ecosystem because they don't have natural predators or they might outcompete. I was driving on 77 um, North, I guess it is. It's not one of the, I mean, it's a highway, but it's not 75, you know, and a, it's very beautiful. Actually, there's white flowering dogwoods and these purple flowering princess trees that I don't remember the name, but it starts with a P and um, and I always like these purple trees and there's more and more and more of them now. And so I had to look them up to see what they were called. And of course I still forgot their name, but um, turns out they're invasive species. And so they're out competing, they're um, like shading out all of the natural habitat. And so the natural vegetation is dying off along the highways. Um, but we know, you know, every organism is using that area for a specific purpose. And so if we're killing off some of the vegetation, then we're losing food for certain parts of your food web or we're losing um, habitats. Um, so anyways, we were talking about the individual populations. In the last chapter, we talked about different distributions. Today, we're talking about the community and the community refers to all of the different species that are living within that ecosystem, right? So here's a good picture of um, an ecosystem along with its community. So the community would include all of the living species, the trees, the birds, the grasses, the antelope, the whatever, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, um, sorry. Okay, so um, all of the organisms that live together, including their interactions, and you guys already talked about interactions with our MSU folks. Um, so we talked about um, symbiosis, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, all that jazz, predator prey. Okay, so we're gonna go with that. And some of these things you'll have talked about with the MSU girls, so I'll just you know flip through them and others will be new. So, um, there's often a confusion between habitat and niche. So I think it's important that we recognize the difference. The habitat is basically where an organism lives and the niche is the role that organism plays within the ecosystem. So it's job basically, right? So you live at your house is your habitat and then the role you play, the daughter, the son, um, the caregiver, the student, um, the person who takes out the trash, the person who makes the dinner, whatever your role is in your family, right? That's your niche. Okay. Um, so here we have, these are barnacles, right? Living on, maybe this is a coral shelf. And um, there's different species within this habitat. And maybe these individuals could maintain this entire habitat, right? and the roles that they play. Um, but, so this is like, it's fundamental niche, the whole role that it could play. But when there's other organisms there, it won't necessarily fill that entire space, right? Some organisms are gonna be out competing like the purple flowering princess tree. Um, so then you have a realized niche. So though this species one um, could occupy this entire area and fill the niche within the ecosystem. 
because this other barnacle here, semi um, because it outcompetes for this area, then species one only has um, a realized niche of the upper portion. So there's competitive exclusion when two species can occupy the same niche, but one outcompetes the other, right? So that's the difference between a fundamental niche and a realized niche. Here's another um, competitive exclusion. No two similar species can occupy the same niche at the same time is, is the rule. So you can keep that in mind. Um, the anoles fill many different niches within a ecosystem and have evolved to be better suited to different spaces. So this is um, microhabitating. So there's a reduced um, competition because they won't fill all of the niche. And over time, there's a whole bunch of activities we could have done with this if we were in school every single day. Um, we would investigate how these different anoles have been, have evolved to fill these different spaces. Um, but because they all fill different spaces, they don't have that competitive exclusion. You already talked about the symbiotic relationship. Um, and remember the competition is when both are negatively affected. Um, they're competing for all kinds of different resources, food, water, habitat, mates, um, predator, prey. The predator um, is benefiting and the prey would be not benefiting, also parasitism. The parasite would benefit and the host would not benefit. And then mutualism, this is just my favorite mutualistic relationship here. Um, I love the cattle egrets. They ride around on the backs of the cattle and they eat the bugs. Um, so they're benefiting because they're getting food and then the cattle is also benefiting because it is um, getting cleaned, if you will. And then commensalism, um, one benefits, but the other one is neither hurt nor harmed. For example, these barnacles are hitching a ride on the whale. The whale's not hurt, not harmed, um, but the barnacles are benefiting from it. So there's lots of different symbiotic relationships we can be familiar with. Commensalism, um, here's another example, the epiphytes, they're called. You probably saw some of these if you went anywhere south on vacation, the air plants. Um, so they're actually getting moisture from the air and, and they're connected to usually the barks of trees. Um, so they're not hurting actually the tree itself, but they're benefiting because um, they have a home, okay? The sea anemone, um, this is off, often a common example. So um, the, the sea anemone is benefiting because the clownfish that has like this slime layer on the outside of it that won't be hurt by the poisonous um, sea anemone is it has a home so it's protected and it attracts other feeder fish to the area because they want to eat the clownfish which allows the sea anemone to feed on the other fish. Um, Predator prey, that's pretty obvious. Um, if you read the bottom part, you're gonna get the names of these. I don't really remember um, off the top of my head, but you can see this bird here. This is competition. This egg is de definitely different than the other eggs. And I wanna say cuckoo, but that's not right. Um, but anyways, this bird hatches and it actually outcompetes the other birds for, um, for food and it'll actually kick them out of the nest. So, so this uh, bird lays its egg in the nest and then lets another bird raise it. Um, but meanwhile, it kills off all the other babies. So, um, uh, you guys have done a lot of this already. This is like, so I'm gonna skip this one. Um, you did the pollinations, I think. You can see the predator prey, um, the benefiting, this is mutualistic. So we've already done some of those. Um, so predator prey, you guys, 
are pretty familiar with, and we already watched the oscillating graph on that one, how one has a lag behind the other. But maybe this is just talking about the evolution and the adaptation that one might have to be a better predator or to um, be able to avoid being prey, right? So um, what kind of adaptations do you think this hawk might have to be a good predator? I have no idea where my chat box is right now. So if you want to just shout it out, I can find my chat. I found it. What kind of um, adaptations do you think this hawk has? Remember, adaptations are, are beneficial traits that they get through evolutionary selection. <coughs> typically, yeah, keen eyesight is typically um, the one that people would come up with, first of all. I'm sure the sharp beak and claws help it as well. Um, so this, the horns, the speed, the coloration, um, allowing it to blend in with its environment are all going to be good um, traits for this organism to be a good hunter. Um, some plants, they have spines or thorns, like your raspberry bushes are picky, right? They have pickers on them. Um, and that, and so do roses, right? So what is the purpose of those thorns? And it's to keep other organisms from eating them. Um, remember the whole purpose of species survival is to reproduce and, and pass on their, their traits. So these, um, these thorns will keep other organisms from eating the fruit because the fruit is what is going to pass on the traits. You can read in, uh, once again, the um, survival of the sickest. It'll talk about the capsaicin that's in some of these peppers. Um, like we burn right but the bird doesn't and that allows the bird to spread its seed um, so thorns toxins spines those are all protective features um, to keep organisms away so some other anti-predator adaptations that organisms have um, we have camouflage and we have a couple different camouflage we want to talk about um, but that allows the um, prey to avoid being detected. So here you can barely see this little lizard on the um, bark of the tree. There's warning signs. So like colors, orange, yellow, red are often warning colors because they're, they're connected with um, usually poisonous organisms. Um, so we have APO other, remember, away, somatic, sign, meaning. So um, so these are like warning signs that keep organisms away. So we have Batesian mimicry and malarian mimicry that you need to be familiar with. Um, we have camouflaging, which is cryptic, meaning that it can blend with its environment. So all of these organisms are blending with their environment really well. I need to adjust my font size. Um, Batesian mimicry is when one organism is mimicking another harmful organism. So the hawk moth um, larva puffs up to look like a poisonous snake. So it itself is not um, poisonous. It would be fine to eat it, but it can mimic the green parrot snake. And so this is Batesian mimicry, when it mimics another organism that is harmful. Um, this is a good example. The, the, um, the, my words, my words. What kind of butterfly is this? Monarch. And the other version is? I think it's the monarch and the, I know it's hawthorn. Um, I'm gonna have to come back to that. Anyways, the, 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 this bird is eating a monarch and you can see that it's actually spitting it up. Um, and the other butterfly actually does not, is not harmful. Um, and if a bird ate it, it actually would not. Um, it would not 
the viceroy that's what he's called sir um so if you ate the viceroy you wouldn't throw up but because it looks like the um monarch then birds will stay away from it because they think it's poisonous so this is an example of batesian mem mimicry and so be between um malarian and batesian the way i remember that is i me i think of this picture here and the and the bird is throwing up so i think a b for bar <laughs> sorry um but that's my mnemonic for remembering one from the other so the batesian makes them throw up um okay so that's one example so this is convergent evolution when two organisms are not related but they um live in the same environmental stress and so they have over time evolved similar traits divergent would be ones that are related and they're then living in different environmental stresses so they diverge they separate and they evolve separate um, traits so these are evolving the same traits so that is um convergent evolution malarian two or more protected species look like each other so they both have some harmfulness to them and um and one looks the same as the other so these you can see the warning signs of um the bee and the wasp here's other examples aposematic so other warning signs so just these color patterns will keep organisms away because through time they've recognized red orange yellow mean it's harmful so don't eat them um so the coral snake is poisonous but the king snake is not so is this batesian mimicry or is this malarian mimicry malarian they're both harmful oops and batesian only one is harmful yeah good okay um so coevolution we talked about convergent um so coevolution is when two organisms rely on each other so over evolutionary time um they've evolved traits that benefit each other okay um so predator prey relationships parasite host relationships and flowers and pollinators so we've seen like the bats or the hummingbirds um or the beaks of finches right they've evolved similarly with their um flower or whatever it is that they're pollinating um so that their beaks their snouts their whatever fits that flower so that would be an example of um co-evolution they coexist oh um my cousin she just texted me and she's with my uncle who you guys heard about him already had that cancer and he's still on a fitty tube and everything and um the fact that she texted i was afraid i had to check because she wouldn't normally text me but everything's fine it was an accident um okay so species diversity so any like you'll get some questions on the test and just remember the more diversity the better it is right because there's more niches there's more food available if one organism dies out kind of like genetic variation right if one if the environment changes, there's still gonna be an organism that's well suited for the area. So just remember, no matter what, diversity is a good thing. Um, so species diversity is really just referring to how many different types of species live in that area. There's usually um, a dominant species, a keystone species is like one that if that one organism was not there, the rest of the ecosystem would crash. So it plays a very, very important role um you you measure the abundance of species by its biomass and usually you would do dry mass of vegetation so you would take away the water weight um environments you know do change over time you've probably seen that um even in your backyard but we can look at different areas that have been disrupted and we can see succession occurring if you were around in a newly um developed area you would see grasses forming first and then little bushes and then herbs and then well herbs and then little bushes and then trees that um, are short and then trees that are big and each organism changes the environment a little bit they might change the amount of sunlight 
they might change the amount of water, they might change the pH of the soil. So every time a new organism arrives, the environmental conditions change and that creates succession. So the changing of the vegetation over time will also change the organisms that come to that area. Okay, so greater biodiversity affords more resources, places to live, um, food to eat, things like that. Um, and they are changing the environment. So here you can see monoculture. Um, so agriculture, we usually use monoculture. So it's just one organism in the area. Um, you'll remember probably we talked about the Irish potato famine during evolution, not this year, um, but you probably did in biology. Um, but they planted only one type of potato and then there was a blight that um, that affected the potatoes. And so all of the potatoes rotted. They only had one type of potato. So the entire area that relied on these potatoes for economic and for food, um, there was a great deal of starvation due to the potatoes dying off. And so that's what's negative about a monoculture. Had they planted a lot of different types of potatoes, likely some of those potatoes would have been resistant to um, the fungus. This is showing you quite a bit of variety in an old field ecosystem. So you can see um, how the environment changes. You have the shorter plants. Um, these are sun loving, less shade tolerant, right? Um, and then over time, the larger plants will take over and they start creating more shade. And so you'll have less of the sun loving plants and more of the shade tolerant plants. Um, so keystone species that totally change the environment, without them, things would not be the same. Sea stars are one of those keystone species. Um, the, there's lots of, it depends on your ecosystem, right? We can talk about different types of um, keystone species, but you can see with this sea star, there's a great deal of diversity within the ecosystem. And when the um, sea star is removed, the mussels that the sea stars would typically eat outgrow like an invasive species and outcompete all the other organisms. And so species diversity will begin to plummet without the starfish. So the starfish are needed to keep the mussels number in check in order to maintain the biodiversity of the ecosystem. Another good example, the sea otter, um, which eats the sea urchins. One of the things that you guys might see in questions is if they take an organism out of a food chain or food web and then ask for the effect it has on the rest of the ecosystem. So. Um, so without a large number of otters, you can see the sea urchins will increase in numbers. And if the sea urchins are increasing in numbers, that means they're going to eat more of the kelp below them, right? And so eventually the kelp numbers will decrease. That's the vegetation that's, that's supposed to support the rest of the food chain. So without the vegetation, the rest of the food chain would die off. So um, when analyzing a food chain or, or a food web, when analyzing a change in the system, because remember the AP is big on change in the system, when you take out one organism, be sure to follow the whole line down. So like you might say, what's going to happen if the sea otters are gone? Then you're going to say, oh, well, then the urchins can keep going. But don't forget to go below them because below them, then the vegetation, if there's more of these, they're going to eat more of these. So when analyzing those chains, make sure you follow all the way to the bottom. Um, in our area, the beaver, right outside our back door, um, we have a beaver dam out at the cross country course that you may not be familiar with because by now we have created a work around the beaver dam. But the beaver dam, um, the beaver kept creating the dam, you know, out there behind the woods, right? There's a river and it goes to Mud Lake. You guys are familiar with that. So the beaver would continue to build up this 
dam and then that would back up the water into um, Mud Lake and then Mud Lake would overflow and it would be like this deep on the cross country course. So um, back in the day, me and Mr. Kohler, the two cross country coaches at the time, we kept digging out the um, beaver dam so that the cross country course wasn't flooded, but the beaver just kept building it back up over and over again. So now if we were in class, we would go outside and we would walk out there and we would see how the drain commission has changed the area. They totally ripped up this area and then um, put in pipes underground to divert water around the beaver dam so that water can still flow between the um, watershed and the mud lake through that stream. So we'd be able to talk about a couple of things. One, the keystone species of the um, beaver dam and how it changes the ecosystem. But also we would be able to talk about secondary succession because when they came in, they tore out all the vegetation of the area. So uh, 15, 20 years ago, that was just like sand and no plants. And then um, over time, we've seen the grasses grow We've seen little bushes grow and now we see trees growing. So we would be able to talk about secondary succession that happens when an area was once um, well established and then it's been um, devastated and has to regrow. So there's, there's a couple of things you can talk about in our own backyard. So ecological succession, you have primary, you have secondary. I'm talking about secondary right now. Other examples, Mount St. Helens erupted, right? And then um, it's lava flow would have killed off all of the vegetation in the area. So it takes many, many years, decades perhaps, for that new vegetation to regrow. So this lava originally would have been like rock, right? So no vegetation can grow on rock. So first you would need lichen. Lichen, I don't know if you remember this, symbiotic relationship between a fungus and um, an algae. And so it actually produces enzyme that breaks down the rocks. And so it starts to create soil and that soil can then support vegetation. And so the first thing you're gonna get is your sun loving plants. Um, so that's secondary succession. Primary succession, when an, when an area has never supported organisms um, before. I said, um, I wanted to say moss earlier, not algae. Um, so basically, if there's been no soil, you have to break down the rocks um, to create that. And so that usually starts with um, bacteria and lichen and mosses. And then you'll replace that with grasses, shrubs, and trees. Um, and then here's an example of secondary succession. Anytime there's a forest fire, um, we have to start from scratch. So you have your pioneer species. So these are key words we should know. Pioneer is the first species. So typically the lichen and mosses are your primary species or your pioneer species. They're gonna be um, replaced with the sun loving plants that are going to be replaced with shade tolerant plants because once one plant starts to grow, it starts to create shade. These are going to change the environment, um, perhaps the water, of the soils, the nutrients of the soils, the pH of the soils, they'll be replaced by shade tolerant plants. Eventually your climax forest is those tallest plants, I guess, the trees and such that won't typically be replaced by other organisms. Okay, so basically the, the key right here that you want to know when it has to do with succession is that each organism that comes in will change the environment. And so then new organisms are better suited for the area. So typically the plants change the soil pH, fertility, meaning nutrients, and the amount of sunlight available. Um, typically you have your R strategist first, right? Quick growing, producing many, many organisms, and then they may be replaced with your K strategist. Climax force is kind of like the end result, um, not that there is a goal end, but um, usually it's your hardwoods that are your um, climax. We have a beach maple forest. 
Um, so this is what we see in our backyard at school. Um, this usually identifies like your biome, right? So biomes are typically identified by the amount of sunlight, temperature, rainfall. And that is going to determine what type of climax forest you have. So we have boreal forest, we have coniferous forest, deciduous forest, like we are deciduous, right? Our leaves fall at, in the winter and then they come back later. Um, each disturbance, um, sometimes disturbance is necessary for the regrowth of a species. So you may see um, like prescribed burns, right? They'll burn off the forest because some forests actually need that in order to regrow. Kind of like getting a germ appeal or whatever they're called, like taking off that top layer of skin so that you can have new cells regrowing. So it rejuvenates the community. The jack pine is one example that requires fire for their pines, cones to open and release their seeds. Um, okay, so this is what happens when we don't learn from ecology. Bad things happen. Okay, so that just kind of introduced a whole bunch of vocabulary maybe and hopefully gave you a working knowledge of the vocabulary. Um, like I said, last time we talked kind of ecology makes sense if you just, you know, be a good reader and a good thinker, you'll be able to analyze most situations. Remember diversity is a good thing um, and you always want the most diversity. What questions do you have? 